Okay, I think we can start. So, core data threading demystified with Marcus Zara. Please welcome him with a huge applause. Good afternoon. Thank you for the, uh, the applause. I appreciate it. So, core data has been around for a while. Um, I was actually looking at some of the header files and I saw dates back in uh, 2004. You know, 11 years, it, it still feels like it's new to me and I'm still kind of learning about it, but it, 11 years, that's, that's quite a while for a framework. Uh, especially today with the mobile stuff, things are changing so fast that it's kind of weird to be using a framework that old. But part of that problem of being 11 years old is there's a lot of information about it on the internet. Lots of blog posts, lots of articles about it, and not very many of them with dates on them. Seems like putting dates on blog posts is a bad thing. So there's a lot of m confusing or conflicting information about this framework that's out there. Uh, not intentionally, but just because it's been around for long enough. That information that was once accurate is no longer accurate. So the goal of this talk is to try to kind of clear the air a little bit about how we should be using core data today, modern, in 2015. The topics for discussion, we have three primary topics for this talk, but we're going to start off with my core truths, the, 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 the building blocks that I use when I'm looking at a framework or looking at core data and how I approach things, when I, whether I'm developing an application or developing a, a subsystem for an existing application. With that, then we're going to go to and discuss the old way. And Old is kind of a misnomer. It's, it's the original way to use core data in a multi-threaded environment. So old kind of works, but it's still fine. So I don't know if the old is the best, the best word for it, but we'll let you decide. Then we're going to discuss the hard way. The hard way is academically very, very interesting. And if you're a, a persistence geek like I am, then you'll probably find it extremely interesting. Um, but it is really, really hard, and it has its uses today and becoming more useful as Apple produces more and more technology for us. And the third primary subject is going to be talking about the best way. Um, and we're going to start that off with defining what best means. And then we'll wrap up with some guidelines, some general things about core data that are kind of edgy, kind of... If you don't know this and you step on it, it's going to hurt. Um, minor things that uh, they may surprise you. But I always like to start off any threading talk with the word why. People will come to me, teams will come to me, companies will come to me and say, okay, we've got a core data problem. We've got, been doing this, the, we've been adding threading to our core data application and we're, we're, we're in a corner. And I always come to them, okay, why did you add threading to core data? Why did you add threading to your application at all? And it's a trick question, so I like asking it because everybody gets it wrong. Usually, almost always the answer is we had a performance problem. I was like, oh, that's cool. So you added threading to, and to solve your performance problem. And now you have what, two, four, eight, 12 performance problems? And they're like, yes, 2, 4, 8, and 12. Yes, we have all of those now. Threading is not a silver bullet. I'm sure you've heard that on the internet a thousand times. If you haven't, you are not Googling well enough. Threading is, adding threads to an application is a design decision that when we make it at the 11th hour before shipping, we're, we picked the wrong time. That's not the time we should be adding it. It's threading is something we add to an application when we find we have spare time, that we sp have spare CPU, we have spare bandwidth, something. Threading is something that we should be adding to our applications when we want to try to predict what the user is going to do next and get ahead of them. So an example of that would be you know, the user's Twitter application, one of my favorite examples. Everybody understands Twitter. 
when you launch a Twitter application, we may use, we should be using threading to grab images that they haven't seen yet because they're not there on their thread yet. Or perhaps caching avatars or grabbing uh, search results or something else. That's what we should be using threading for. We should be using threading to predict what the user is going to do and get, and get there first so that when they actually go to ask us for it, they're amazed because, wow, this app is snappy. It's really quick. No, 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 it's just been working its butt off ahead of you. That's what threading should be for. We should be doing things in the background for the user. We should be doing things that the user doesn't need to wait for. Doing things like, again, posting a tweet. The user should not really have to wait for that network call to come back. We don't need to put a spinner on the screen and tell the user, hey, my time is way more precious than your time. You will wait and I will tell you if that tweet posted or not. No, you cannot read anything else until I am done. That it's, it's, a, it's, it's a poor user experience. Threading should be solving those poor user experiences. It's not a performance solution, unfortunately. So I could talk about threading all day long because I constantly see, and I, to be fair, I've done it myself plenty, plenty of times. Going, oh, I'll just wrap that in a thread and kick it off till later. And then six months later going, okay, that bit me. So threading, we, we should be looking at threading at the design time of an application. We should not be looking at it at the 11th hour. So core concepts about doing threading with core data. First one is, and this is a really, really big one that, that will solve so many problems. A single source of truth. When we're working with core data and we have one or more in us manage object contexts, we need one that we say is the truth. One where the user interface accesses. And the user interface is our truth. We're a, we develop user facing applications now. We don't build applications that are sitting on a mainframe or things like that. We're on iPhones, we're on iPads, we're on personal computers. So the user is the one that should be getting the truth at all times. So therefore, we should have a context dedicated to the user and dedicated to giving them the truth. This is a single source of truth is kind of a, it's, it's a banking phrase, it's a database phrase, a mainframe phrase where you say this right here, anything that is here is, is the truth and whenever we need to confirm which one has the right answer, this one wins. That's what a single source of truth means. All user interfaces are single threaded. I don't know if you didn't know that, surprise. Coco is single threaded. The user interface is single threaded and it's not something that's specific to Coco. Every user interface out there that I've ever run across in any language is single threaded. Now, if you've ever tried to stand up a UI view controller on a background thread, that does not end well. If the UI thread is single thread, if the UI is single threaded, then we should be accessing the UI from the single source of truth. Those two should go together and be on the same thread, and therefore being on the same queue since we're using queues now instead of threads. To go along with that, if we're not servicing the UI, we should not be on the UI thread. If we're consuming JSON, we don't belong on the UI thread. If we're pushing data up to a server, whether it be a tweet or a bank transaction, we don't belong on the main thread, ever. Get off of it. We don't, it's for the user interface only. And those, doing just these three things will solve most performance problems with core data. Sorry, this mic's a little sensitive. Just by following these rules, no matter which of the three systems that we use with core data, we're not going to have that many performance problems. And well, we're certainly not going to have performance problems with core data. UI code, that's a whole nother world. So the old way, the original way, the way that we used to do core data threading before iOS 6. Now, I say iOS 6, a uh, little bit tongue in cheek. Apple programming frameworks did a fairly massive concept shift around iOS 5. And it had, in my opinion, because I don't know, um, it had a lot to do with the huge influx of developers that we got. 
So before iOS, before the iPhone was ever public in any way, shape, or form, the number of Objective-C developers you could probably count on one hand. There were, there were not very many of us. And we're kind of all on the same mailing list. We all knew each other, and we generally knew the developers inside of Apple. And the way Apple would release frameworks, they had sharp edges. And they didn't really tell you about them because they knew you'd find them. And when you found them, you'd email somebody that you knew that was on that team. And then you would discuss it and you would solve the problem. And it was because it was such a small, tight-knit community. So a lot of things had sharp edges. A lot of things would just say, yeah, go ahead and run that. And if it blows up, it blows up and you'll figure it out. Well, threading was kind of like that. So it was like, oh, what's the threading rules? Don't know. Let us know when you figure that out. Let us know when you hit a threading problem and we'll let you know if that was the right answer or not. You know, you go onto the old Coco mailing list, the, you know, the email mailing list of Coco back in the days, and you'd get different answers for threading on different days because it, they didn't really know either. It was, it was still kind of new technology. But they were confident that we would let them know when we had problems. And then suddenly it wasn't, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 developers. You know, from 2006 to 2008, I think we went from maybe 10,000 developers to half a million developers. That's a lot of emails for them to respond to. I remember dub dubs where the entire labs were completely filled with groups going, okay, if you retain, it increments the retain count by one, and when you release, it decrements it by one. When it hits zero, it goes away, and if you go to negative one, it crashes. And literally, it would be full of rooms like that because there's this huge influx coming from Ruby and coming from C Sharp and Java, and they're all like, so do that, say that again, go over that again, you know, because it was a hard concept. And it was, so we had this huge influx of people that weren't at the, you know, I know Objective-C and I'm running into this problem with threads when I do this. It was, so we actually have to maintain memory. You know, it was, it was a, a, a huge influx of people that didn't have the knowledge. And it wasn't that, like that they were stupid, it was just, these were concepts that they never had to deal with. You know, there were so many fourth generation languages out there, they, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have to do that? Really? So Apple had to do a shift. They had to do a paradigm shift in how they were approaching the frameworks and the APIs. And one of those was around threading, because threading is really, really hard. Threading, it's, it's super hard. We all get it wrong. And when I say we, I don't mean third-party developers. I mean every developer on the planet, whether they're inside of Apple or outside of Apple, will get threading wrong some of the time. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. It's right up there with solving AI. I'm still convinced AI is going to solve threading because humans can't do it. <laughs> so the old way that we did, going back to this, I was assuming, no, I'm continue with that. They did the paradigm shift, and they did it in iOS 5 is where we really saw the big paradigm shift. You know, threads, we don't really use them anymore. We use queues, we don't use threads. What are the differences? Well, there aren't any differences except a couple that you never ever run across if you do everything right. Um, I did a big, big, big discussion about queues yesterday during the workshop, and it's, they're fascinating because they work exactly the same as threads, except for when we write our code wrong and they protect us from ourselves, which is kind of cool. In iOS 5, Core Data made a change, and they said, okay, there are now three types of managed object contexts, and you can use one of these three, and it were helping you to define threading a little better. Except it didn't really work very well in iOS 5. It was a little flaky, it was a little unstable, it had just been released. So you know, the, the current standing at that time was don't use it. You know, let, give it another year, give it some time to get fleshed out, let's get the bugs out of it, and let's go ahead and use it in iOS 6. So I've, since then I've always referenced going, okay, the paradigm shift actually happened in iOS 6. iOS 5 was a beta, iOS 6 is when it actually started working. So pre-iOS 6, this is how we used core data. It still works today. Don't really want to use it very often except for at certain edge cases, but it still works just fine. You start off and you have one persistent store coordinator. The persistent store coordinator handles all the interactions to disk. It's the one that takes the data from disk, realizes that it objects, passes it back out. We use one, just one for the application. Don't generally need more than one. Every time we'd create a managed object context, it would talk directly to that persistent store coordinator. So all of them would interact with the persistent store coordinator. And they wouldn't know each other existed. They didn't care that each other existed. 
The problem came is when we wanted to let one context know that we made a change in another context, probably on another thread. We had to handle that through noti the notification system because every managed object context, every time you made a change, it would then broadcast a notification that we had to consume and hand off to the other context, and we had to do this correctly. This became a bit of a problem because this was kind of a, a system that was refined over a couple of years. So as Cordata first came out, nobody, everybody was like, oh, just lock stuff, you know, lock and synchronize, figure it out yourself. And then it got, okay, don't do that. And more and more defined rules developed over the years, and they were still kind of confusing. So in this system, we always had one single source of truth for the user interface, right? The, the main managed object context, the one that we would pick to be feeding the user interface. It wasn't special. It wasn't defined any other way because it was only one way to define a context, but it was one that we had to as a design, or have to still as a design, say this is the one that's going to feed the user interface. The user interface is not going to come from any other thread because the interface, user interface is single threaded. Issues. So the issue with this design is it is a large amount of code. You know, the old complaints about core data having a tremendous amount of code and a lot of boilerplate and it was hard to use. This is the time period where that came from and this design is where that came, that, those kind of comments came from. It was a large amount of code. You would, by the end of your application, you would have core data kind of littered everywhere inside of your app. Uh, this is the politest way I can put this statement. There's, I have used other ways to describe this issue. You could literally get different answers from different developers on different days on how, the, how you were supposed to handle the threading of core data uh, before iOS 6. You know, it started off with, oh, just lock the context and you synchronize and everything will be fine. That didn't work very well. So then the answers were, okay, one context per thread and everything that comes out of that context belongs to that thread. And well, you can read on other threads, that'll be okay, but don't write on other threads and that'll work most of the time. And then it was like, okay, don't even read on the threads, just read on the one thread, write on the thread, you know, everything belongs within the thread, they're all siloed, and you would get the, the people saying, well, it's not thread safe. And the other people going, well, it's thread safe, but you've got to follow their siloing rules really, really tightly. And the answer is, well, how do I know if I got the threading rule right? Well, you don't until it crashes, and then you know you got it wrong. And it would only crash every once in a while on a blue moon on certain devices. The threading rules were a mess. They were very, very difficult to follow. We had no way to confirm or deny whether we got a threading rule right. So you, know, you could, can easily imagine severe arguments during code reviews going, no, 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 that's right. The other person going, no, that's wrong. And the right answer is, well, they're kind of both right because who knows until it crashes. And even if it crashes, you're not sure either because it may not even be crashing right where that code is. It's, that's why threading sucks, it's really hard. On top of that, sometimes we would block the wrong thread at the wrong time and all of a sudden the entire application just halts and you have absolutely no idea why. Because someone was listening to a notification on another thread and they were trying to consume it on the wrong thread and their UI was doing something bizarre that was calculating pi and taking a long time and caused the entire app to halt. And they're all the way over here, hardly even anywhere near where the actual notification fired from. And people are just, you know, you're just scratching your head because I have no idea. And then you end up you know, just littering your application with NS logs to hopefully try to capture this so you can figure out exactly how you got there to that locking point. Really, really hard to solve those problems. Again, threading is hard. When you start listening to the not notifications, they get chatty. You, if you start, you know, you, you tend to get a little bit uh, over anxious and start listening to the notifications all over the place. And they get very, very chatty, which impacts performance, which then causes surprise thread locking, and then you're going through your application, pulling your hair out, trying to figure out why it works 99% of the time, the other percent, it just stops. Once you'd got it right, all of a sudden it was like, don't ever touch the performance system, the persistence engine again, ever. Don't touch these three files. Anybody ever been on a project like that where the UI, you can touch that. 
don't touch these. These are Fred's. Fred is the only person allowed to work on this code. If anybody else touches this code, we have to go through this whole regression cycle, and it's going to take us months, and you'll probably get fired. Don't touch these three files. That, that's, you know, that's where, th you know, threading bugs cause rules like that to show up in teams. Like, only certain person understands how this works. They have this flowchart in their head, and no, it's, there's no knowledge transfer. You will never get it. Don't do it. I, I remember being either being that guy or like, oh, I got to go talk to Fred again. I screwed it up. <laughs> the good news is this has gotten a bit better in iOS 9. Um, we have a debug flag now starting in 8 or 9. Uh, no, we started in 8. That allows us to at least confirm that we got the threading right. Um, actually, it came out in 5 and was quickly retracted in 5 and then came back out in 8. Um, it was actually a hard option in five where if you got the threading rules wrong, your app crashed. People who were developing Cordato was like, yay, finally we get con confirmation whether we got this right or wrong. And then everybody else is like, 25% of the apps on the App Store are crashing on launch. So it, it quickly disappeared during the betas, but thankfully it came back in eight as a debug flag. So we, were, we are now able to at least confirm if we got our threading right or wrong, and we got a little bit more confirmation. Um, and there's some other features that came out in 9 that made things a little bit easier. But th the old way was, it was difficult. It was confusing. And when you went to the internet to get answers, you would get different answers. And you wouldn't know which ones were right because nobody puts dates on their blog posts. So you don't know if you're reading information from 2006 or 2014. The hard way. This is my personal favorite because it's intellectually interesting. Um, it's academically interesting to me. Uh, hopefully, I don't see it in production very often. So SQLite is the persistence level that we tend to use all the time. It's the one that we use to store everything on, on disk. It's designed to, be multiple pro to have multi-process access, so we can have more than one persistent store coordinator talking to it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's designed for that. So we can have multiple threads talking to it at the same time. We don't have to have just one persistent store coordinator. If we can have more than one persistent store coordinator, we can have multiple mocks talking to each of the persistent store coordinators. And now all of a sudden we don't have to worry about locking so much. All of a sudden we have no fear of blocking from one thread to another thread, from one context to another context. We can happily be pushing data in from one direction and consuming data from another direction. We have as close as we're going to get to true asynchronous processing, true asynchronous writing out to the persistent store coordinator. Now, there's, there's a still a sliver of a chance of blocking. And I always have to put that out there because you know if you, if you build the test right, you can still hit a block. And the reason for that is just because most of the work that a persistent store coordinator has done is doing up in the CPU. It's doing uh, up in memory to take our objects and turn them into SQLite calls so that it can prepare and talk to SQLite. That's where the bulk of, the, of a save operation or a fetch operation or a read operation is happening. And then there's a small sliver of actually talking to the database. And during that small sliver, if you're hitting the same table in the same record in the same row at the exact same time, you will get a lock. So I, I leave that out there. You know, it's not 100% true asynchronous. It's 99.99% true asynchronous. So it's really super close. And it's getting better and better every year. I mean, not, with wall mode turned on and with some of the new, new stuff that's been added to the SQLite, it's getting harder and harder to get that lock to happen. So the good news is, is we can get super, super close to that true asynchronous. And even in this design, we still want to have one context that feeds the user interface. We don't want to have multiples. We always still want to have one, one that exists on the thread that is associated with the user interface. So issues with this design. <laughs> it's a very, very hard way to do this. Um, I don't recommend doing this unless you have a very specific problem that you're trying to solve. It's really, really difficult for us to get it just right because threading, you know, threading was hard before. Now we're going to add another another level to it. 
we add that another level because the persistent stores don't talk to each other at all. all right? At least when we had multiple managed object contexts so that were talking to a single persistent store coordinator, that one persistent store coordinator had an idea as to what was going on, and the context could at least query it or reset or get, or, or get some information from them. With multiple persistent store coordinators talking to a single SQLite file, we don't even have that. One is writing to the writing to the SQLite file, the other one's reading, and they have no idea about each other at all. So we can get out of sync with our data fairly easily. Notifications that we were using in the original design don't exist in this design. And this has changed a bit in iOS 9. We add, they added a new feature to allow these uh, us to consume remote notifications. But you can't just take notifications from one persistent store coordinator and have, the, have another one consume them. There is no process for that. So we have to do a bit more dancing to get that right. The threading is even trickier than the first version. Right? It's, it, we've got tons and tons of threading issues going on with this design as we got to make sure that our persistent store coordinators and our managed ob object contexts are talking to each other on the correct threads. Maintainability is just out the window. Um, it is, you know, we've taken the hard way, we've taken the original way that we were really confused with and really messy with and just added another layer of complexity to it. Why would we want to do this though, right? Well, with watch OS 1, we'd want to do it because that way we could actually have multiple processes, two processes talking to the same core data file, SQLite file on disk. And with our glances and things like that, there's, there's reasons why we want multiple applications talking to the same SQLite file. So we get into the state where we actually need to be able to do this because we've got a, a, a um, more than one process, more than one application actually talking to a SQLite file. And it's also good to know how this works or at least understand the concept of these multiple persistent store coordinators talking to a same SQLite file because this is also how iCloud works with core data. You can understand why it took a few years for iCloud to get really nice and stable and work really well. And I have on there that it can be used with the Apple Watch, but this has gotten shifted on us in iOS 2. So now we have to, we can't quite do it this way anymore with the watch, unfortunately. And last but not least is the best way to handle. So what does best mean? What, what do I mean by the word best? Best is not fastest. You know, if you're looking for the fastest persistence engine out there, you are not looking for something that works with objects. You're not looking for Objective-C, core data, or anything like that. Object-oriented uh, object programming is slow. If you need the fastest, you need to be working with C or something even lower. SQLite, something like that. And generally, fastest is going to be some of the ugliest, nastiest code on the planet. I have written some really fast parsing engines, and I'm really not proud of them. They're, they're not pretty. And there's a lot of notes in there because I don't understand them six months later. They, they're they're kind of like Perl, if you've ever dealt Perl. It's like, hey, this thing is really, really fast. Can you fix? No, I can't fix it. <laughs> I really can't. I, I, it would take me another six months because I would have to write it again to be able to fix that bug. So in my opinion, my view, best is the easiest to use and the most maintainable. Best is code that I can look at with a cup of coffee and understand it before I finish the cup of coffee. Best is consumable code, code that I can just say, oh, that's where the bug is, or at least be able to trace the bug without being able to use, having to use a whiteboard. This kind of goes to the, the quote from Brian Kernigan. If debugging is that hard, why would we ever want to write code at the edge of our ability? And if I don't understand it six months later, I'm screwed. I have to start all over again. So the best way, we go back to having one persistent store coordinator. But now here's where we do a little bit of a twist, because now we're going to use the new uh, APIs that, were, that 
we're working in iOS 6. We're going to add a private manage object context that talks to that persistent store coordinator. And then we're going to add our main context, and we're going to define it as a main context, and we're going to make that as a child of that private manage object context. And then any data processing will be below the main manage object context. So we will have three levels of contexts. Our main has not changed. We still have one main. It still feeds the UI, except now it's actually defined as a main. It can only be used on the UI thread. And if we try to use it on another thread and we have our debug flag on, it will crash and we'll know we're doing it wrong. So we got really nice, clear cut the way things work. This is not my design, by the way. This is a design I actually stole from the uh, UI managed document. That's a typo. UI managed document came out with this in iOS 5, and I was like, oh, how are you saving without blocking the main thread? That's kind of cool. And I kind of stole it from them. So this design allows us to have asynchronous saves, which is extremely important, allows us to save without blocking the UI, and it allows us to consume or process data without blocking the UI. A user can happily scroll through our application, they can look at data, they can play with it, and we're not telling them that they have to wait for us, that they don't have to wait for our code. And it's not a lot of code for us either. We can stand this up literally in eight lines of code. So what issues does this one have? I'll admit, I was scratching the bottom of the barrel to find issues because this is... the it's currently the right way, so it doesn't have a lot of issues. The biggest one out there that you will most likely find on the internet is that it is slower. We have an extra level of, of indirection between the persistent store and the main, main manage object context, so we will get a little bit of slowness there. When I say little bit, I mean if I build up a test case that does uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of iterations, I will find a one to two percent variance in the speed. So. But technically, academically, yes, it is slower. Again, if you're looking for raw speed, you should not be looking at, at Objective-C. The other problem with it is it's, it's rough for new developers. There's a lot of things that just work or things that just happen, and you don't have any code to go with them. You're like, I save this data on this NS operation, on this, this private context over here, and the UI updated. How? and there's no direct link to the code there. And so it, it, it can be rough for developers who don't understand core data. However, to be fair, core data is rough for developers who don't understand core data. So it's, you know, core, da core data comes at persistence from a different direction than most other languages. So it's, it's rough, period. It can be more code. Um, I have run into situations where people get really, really excited about blocks. And they can, uh, they can use blocks to a very interesting new level. Um, I have seen uh, persistence layers where they have 12,000 lines of code in one class because everything can go into a block, so why do I need a new class to do things? And it can be messy that way. So it can be more code only because it, it tempts us. It says, ooh, I can do this in a block. So I'll do that in a block, and then I'll put a block in that block, and then I'll put a block in that block, and ooh, I'll put a block in that block, and then six months later when we go to ship, we're like, why is the persistence layer one object? So it can, it can make that mistake. Um, to go along with that, what I call code puke is real easy, and that's the, the blocks within blocks within blocks within blocks, because it's, it's so easy. I don't want, oh, I don't have to create a new file. You know, I gotta grab the mouse. I gotta go up to the file menu. I gotta come up with a name for it. That's, I'll just put it in a block. So, true story, I was uh, helping out a team to solve a, a problem. The workshop people heard the, heard the full story of this yesterday. And we were trying to solve, they, they brought me in to try to solve a threading problem that they had. Uh, the, the bug said, code, or Data appears and disappears on launch randomly. And at first, I, I looked at the project. I compiled it. I was happy that it compiled without me having to do any other dances or, or killing chickens. And then I, I ran it. And sure enough, 
code appeared, disappeared, or data appeared, disappeared, then other data appeared, disappeared, and it did this three or four times, and then it settled down and it worked. And if you launched it, it did it again with different data and a different number of times. It was, it was really cool. I probably, I think I launched it like 12 times in a row just watching that, it was kind of cool. So I, I, I looked inside the project, I'm like, are you using core data? Yes, okay, good. Do you have a network controller? Yes, ooh, awesome, this can't be that hard. And this is where I was like, oh, 12,000 lines of code in one file, that's cool. And what they'd done, innocently enough, it started off with saying, oh, I have this one restful call, okay, well, I'm using a, a framework for the networking, eh. And it's got a, a block return, so it's got a completion block. So in that completion block, now I've got this payload of NS data. Well, I need to turn it into JSON, so ooh, I don't want to do that on the main thread, so I'll put that in a block on a dispatch async so I can consume the JSON and turn it into objects. And now that I've got that, ooh, I'm going to call perform block on core data so that I can take the JSON objects and turn those into core data objects, and then I'm going to save those and I update on the UI. That worked. I'm going to do that again. And again, and again, and if, mind you, it's async, 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 and now I've got 15 restful calls that are all asynchronous, that are consumed asynchronously, that are processed into core data asynchronously, and that arrive at the UI asynchronously. So it's about 15 times four, so you're looking at 40, 60 different points of time that can come in randomly and appear on the UI. And that was what's, what's causing the UI to appear and disappear based on whatever got to it first. Code puke like that could be really easy um, just because of the blocks. And blocks are great, but it's so easy to just add another block and just get just another tab off that left margin. What's, what's one more step off that left margin, right? I don't have to create a new file. So that's, that's one of the issues. Not a lot of issues with it. Um, it's the, the slightly slower tends to hang up a lot of people, which baffles me. And then the code puke is what always catches everybody later. Because they're like, yeah, it was great, and now we're doing a code review, and that guy's no longer with us. Can you come fix this? Guidelines. Single source of truth. So many problems with threading, so many problems with core data um, are instantly solved, unavoidable or, or unavoidable to be avoided or impossible if we just have one managed object context that feeds our user interface. Just doing that. If nothing else, if you ignore everything else I've said, if you just do that, you will avoid most of the problems that people have run into with this persistent system. Another fun gotcha is if you do use the, the third system, the best system, don't reuse those child mocks that are underneath the main managed object context. Use them once, they're cheap, throw them away. Don't hang on to them, don't build up a cache of them, don't have them associated with threads so that you can reuse them in a pool or any of the other clever things that I've seen. Use them once, create them, use them, save them, throw them away. They're absolutely disposable, they're super, super cheap to create. The reason for this is because data changes only go up. Right? So if, I make, if I'm consuming data in a child of the main and I save that data, it goes up to the main just fine, automatically, magically for us. But it doesn't go back down to any siblings of that child. So if I have 10 of them in memory in a pool for me to re be able to reuse, they will get out of sync really, really, really fast. So think of them as only having, as being snapshots in time is the way I like to describe them. The, you, know, you create a mock, you use it, don't expect any other changes to magically show up in it. And my favorite, whoever's developing your UI, if you're using core data, they will come to you and say, your NS fetch results controller is blocking my user interface. Core data sucks. And then they will pull up instruments and they will prove it to you that the NS fetch results controller is behind all of the stuttering in their UI. And then you just need to turn that little arrow next to the NSFS results controller and so you can find out which one of their table view cells is actually causing the performance problem. But th it gets blamed a lot. Um, it's, it is usually the thing that people find first when they're looking for UI performance problems. And just for the reason, the simple reasons is because it is the linchpin between a lot of iPad, iPhone UIs and core data. 
So when you're doing bulk changes in core data, it's the one that's going to be feeding the whole user interface. So it tends to show up in there. Therefore, we should be using instruments a lot while working with core data, while working with our UI, and making sure that where the performance problems are are not where we think they are. We're not guessing at them by just doing log statements or some other clever stuff. Constantly use, use instruments while you're working with your core data, while you're writing your data importers, while you're writing your exporters, and mainly just to make sure you are not on the main thread. There have been plenty of times where I've written code, and I'm like, hey, this thing works, it wor works really well, and I write an instrument, so I'm like, ooh, I uh, didn't even catch that. I am back on the main thread processing that JSON. Crap, I am blocking the UI. Instruments will protect us against that. It will help us to see how much data processing we're doing on which thread, and it will avoid a lot of those performance problems. So I am out of time. I will be out front, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your attention and time today. We have time. We have five minutes. We have some time for questions. Oh, yeah. okay. we, we, we actually have time for questions, so we can do five or Excellent. seven okay. minutes of questions. I'm just so used to running over time, I assumed. Hey, Marcus, thank you very much. Just a quick question of what impressed me the most. This class with 12,000 lines of code, how many, how many times per year did these guys do a code review? They didn't. They were a startup. They were in San Francisco, and they were doing 80-hour weeks. So nobody was doing code reviews. And this is a very common problem in the little startups. It's, it's, a, it's a startup mentality of we have money, we have an unrealistic deadline, and we need to beat our developers to death to make sure that they ship by this deadline that we picked before we decided what the app was going to do. So that, it's that kind of mentality. That's what it was driving them, and it's one I unfortunately see fairly often. So eventually when they got the second round of funding, they decided to make a code review and then... Uh. Yes, uh, once, the, once we actually shipped, because to add to that story, by the way, they brought me in for three weeks because or I was working for three weeks because their main developer was going on vacation for three weeks and they were shipping in two weeks. So after that, he decided he was gonna go work somewhere else. We built a whole new development team and rewrote the app. Uh, hello, Marcus. Uh, my name is Gregory. Um, I have more technical question to you. Um, so uh, you described the best way to organize uh, the work with core data. And I was wondering, uh, when you save your child mock, uh, should uh, the save event propagate to main context so it eventually gets saved to persistent store? Or it only saves your changes to uh, your main uh, context and that's all and you wait for some other event to save it to real database I get to give you my favorite answer in the world for that it's a business decision <laughs> when we use this design we don't we're no longer tied to having code decisions on when we can save because it used to be back in the old way it's like oh I need to save every 10 records or we'll feel it in the UI you know, if, you ever, if we've ever had to do that, and it'll be a magic number in a pound to find somewhere going, okay, if we save every six, it's fast enough that we won't feel the stutter in the table view or something like that. But by doing this design, we no longer are limited by that. We're no longer having to feel I.O. On the, on the main thread, so we can make that decision as a business decision. So it depends on the data at that point. Is the data recoverable? Is it cheap to get again? Yes, then I'll save later. Maybe, I, maybe I'll save on exit, and I don't even care. It's a Twitter feed, who cares, I can get it again. Or, this is a medical record that does not exist anywhere else on the planet. I'm gonna save that sucker right now, right? Because it, it becomes a data slash business decision at that point. How valuable is the data? How easy is it to recover that data? If it's hard to recover or unrecoverable, we wanna save it and back it up and make three copies of it or whatever we wanna do. But if it's super cheap, I may save later, why bother? I may throw it into the main thread and save it at exit or something like that or when the user is watching a video or you know, doing something else or I, I detect that the device is idle. Mm -hmm. you know, how many times have we launched Twitter and then set the phone down? 
detect that, save during that time. That we, it lets us make that a business slash user experience decision as opposed to I must save now because I'm impacting the UI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And what about uh, if you should have two child contexts which should share uh, changes between themselves? No. Or they do not do this? In, in the interest of complete transparency, you can make them, but it's a square peg, round hole kind of thing. You can use notifications to force one child to consume updates from the other child. Don't do this. It's, it's just a bad I, idea. I get it. <laughs> way, way better to just throw them away. Don't, if, if, you've got, if you've got a situation where you're going to have two children and one's going to be dependent on the results of the other, create the second one later. They're so cheap to create that you can just create them you know, in line like that. Um, don't, or just at, at that point in time, maybe it's just one operation and just use that same context for both of those pieces. But don't, don't try to get siblings to share data like that. It's, it's just heartache. It's, you're, it's, it's not gonna end well. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, time for the last question, I think, and then. My name is Milos. I have uh, just one question regarding Realm. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with Realm. Yes. So I just uh, wanted to know uh, what is your, I mean, opinion about Realm and data, uh, core data? Should we, I mean, should we use other, I mean, which one is, uh, is uh, more suitable for you? So Realm has a th few things that I'll discuss about it. Um, First, my opinion on third-party code is well known. Um, all code sucks. Realm is trying to solve a problem I think that is the incorrect problem to solve. They're trying to be faster than core data, where core data is trying to be fast enough, but maintainable. Um, in my playing with, with Realm and working with Realm, I found that the, the amount of code you write is about equal. Um, their migrations, to me, are a little bit more voodoo than I like. Um, but they're trying to be fast, which, you know, good for them, but that's not what I want. As a project leader or a developer, I want maintainability and I want consistency. Um, my big concern with third-party frameworks is they go away. Uh, it, it happens over and over and over and over and over again, and we don't know how long Realm's going to be here. I don't understand their business model. I don't, I don't know. Um, Cordata for me is good enough. It's, it's mature, it's been around long enough, and it's fast enough. And if it's not fast enough, I'm probably doing something wrong because I'm, you know, I'm in object space anyway. So there's a lot of unknowns about Realm. You know, they have the, 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 the storage is opaque, things like that, that make me a little jittery. Where for core data, it's a known, it's a known quantity. Apple's not gonna throw it away tomorrow, right? Um, the SQLite is, op is, is transparent. I can look into the data. I can get the data. Even if it does go away tomorrow, I can still look at it. You know, it's, to me, it's good enough, of course. But then again, it's my hammer. You know? So it's, it's the thing that I use the most. Is there anything wrong with Realm? No. Play with it. Use it. It might be great. But it doesn't, to me, it doesn't solve the right problems. It doesn't, it just, it's not significantly better then core data to the point where we're like, oh, wow, this is so much better. Why would anybody use core data? It's like, okay, it's faster. Awesome. Good for you. It's not less code. And it not, not, doesn't have the maturity of core data yet. You know, ask me again in a year. I may change my mind. Okay. So? Thank you. Thank you.